In the previous segment, we saw that what united modern science and European imperialism was the urge to discover and conquer. The empire supported scientific explorations because these explorations, again and again, proved themselves to be very useful. At first, the empire supported mainly geographical explorations, but soon they spread to many other fields, such as medicine and botany and physics and zoology and history and linguistics and so forth. Even studies, which seemed to be completely useless, were often supported by the European empires because you could never really know what they might discover and what might be the usages of uh, uh, their discoveries. Uh, for example, in the 19th century, botanists and anthropologists who uh, studies the folk medicines of uh, uh, local shamans and witch doctors in South American tribes, they discovered the cure or at least uh, some treatment for malaria uh, from the tree, from the bark of a tree called qu uh, quinine. And this discovery was later, was then used by the Europeans to conquer much of Africa and much of the tropical countries of the world, which previously they couldn't do because the European soldiers died in thousands from malaria. Now, when they had this, this uh, 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 secret cure that they got from the study of Indians in South America, now they could invade and conquer Africa without dying in their thousands uh, uh, from malaria. And this is why so the empires financed and supported a lot of explorations into all kinds of uh, strange subjects. Take, for example, what the British did in India. For comparison's sake, let's look first what the Muslims did when they conquered India. When the Muslims conquered India, they did not bring with them archaeologists to systematically study Indian history. They did not bring anthropologists to study Indian culture. They did not bring geologists and zoologists to study the, the soils and the uh, uh, animals of India. But when the British conquered India, this is exactly what they did. The British explored not only things with obvious utility, such as where past the main roads of India or where is the location of the gold mines. The British also took the trouble to collect information about rare Indian spiders, to catalog the butterflies of India, to trace the ancient origins of extinct Indian languages which nobody spoke, and even to dig up all kinds of forgotten ruins in order to better understand the ancient history of India. A good example of what the British did is the discovery of the ancient Indus Valley Civilization. The Indus Valley Civilization was the first great civilization of India. It was destroyed around 2000 BC and was then completely forgotten. No Indian knew anything about it in the modern age until the British came. There were ruins of the cities of the Indus Valley civilization, which you could see here in their ruins in the Indus Valley. But none of the rulers or inhabitants of India prior to the British bothered to go and study these ruins. And then came the British, and in 1922, a British archaeological survey discovered the ruins of Mohenjo-daro, one of the biggest cities of this ancient Indus Valley civilizations, and the British then devoted a lot of money and efforts to dig up these ruins and to begin studying this lost civilization. Another example of the European scientific curiosity is the deciphering of Egyptian hieroglyphics. The last person who was able to read hieroglyphic script probably died sometime in the early first millennium AD in the Roman Empire when Egypt was ruled by the Romans. Since then, the inhabitants of Egypt frequently encountered hieroglyphic script on all kinds of monuments and ancient ruins and broken pots. 
but they had no idea how to read these uh, strange writings. And as far as we know, very few of them, if any, tried uh, to do so. For example, when the uh, Arabs conquered Egypt in the 7th century, as far as we know, they made no attempt to decipher hieroglyphics and to study the ancient history of Egypt. Similarly, when the Mamluks conquered Egypt in the 13th century, and when the Turks, the Ottoman Turks, conquered Egypt in the 16th century, they also, they made no serious attempt to decipher hieroglyphics. Hieroglyphics was eventually deciphered only when the Europeans came and conquered Egypt. In 1798, Napoleon invaded Egypt. When his soldiers were busy building a fort at a place called Rosetta, these French soldiers, they, well, they were digging to, to make the fort and they discovered a stone with three inscriptions on it. One in ancient Greek, one in Demotic script, and one in hieroglyphics. Now, as usual, Napoleon's invasion army was accompanied by scientists. Napoleon took with him 160 scientists from different disciplines to study Egypt. And when the soldiers discovered this stone, it was quickly brought to the attention of these scientists. And they immediately recognized the crucial importance of this stone, which might be the key to deciphering the lost writing of ancient Egypt. Because they had three inscriptions, one of which they could easily read, the Greek. And if they assumed it's the same inscription, they could use the Greek in order to understand also the ancient uh, Egyptians, the hieroglyphics. Uh, two years later, in 1801, the French army in Egypt was defeated by the British. And as part of the surrender terms, the French had to give up the Rosetta Stone to the British. And the British very gladly took it. The British also recognized the importance of this stone. Even the soldiers in the British army, the generals, they realized the importance of this stone for science. So they demanded it from the French and they took it and they put it in the British Museum where it is still standing. But the British allowed scholars from all over Europe, not just Britain, to come and try to decipher the Rosetta Stone. Everybody could easily read the Greek part of the stone, and it was hoped that by comparing the Greek with the hieroglyphic, you could decipher and understand the hieroglyphic. And after 20 years of, of attempts, it was uh, by an ironic justice, a French, a French scholar called Champollion, who finally managed to decipher the hieroglyphic part of the Rosetta Stone, and this was the crucial breakthrough which enabled scientists to, lay, to later read countless other ancient Egyptian inscriptions and to begin exploring the forgotten world of ancient Egypt in detail. What we today know, not only about the ancient history of Egypt, but about the ancient history of the whole world, about all kinds of animals and plants all over the world, about outer space, about the structure of atoms, it all owes a very huge debt to the contribution of the European empires. The empires, of course, did not support everything. They supported mainly scientific projects which they thought could be of some use to them. And not necessarily by inventing new technologies, but it could also be useful, science could also be useful by allowing us, allowing the Europeans to get to know better the lands which they now ruled, or also by uh, uh, giving all kinds of ideological support to the European empires. And I want to emphasize in particular this last point that the European empires supported scientific projects because these could give them ideological support. This can be seen, for example, in the support that the European empires gave to the study of history and archaeology and biology. It is no coincidence 
that these very fields of science, history, archaeology, and biology, that enjoyed a lot of help from the European empires, they developed historical and biological theories that gave justification and legitimacy to the European empires and to the European control of the world. In the 19th century and in the early 20th century, historians and archaeologists argued that most of the great achievements of humankind were due to the efforts of the white race, of the Europeans, and biologists at the same time argued that the white race, according to their studies, is biologically superior to all the other races. According to uh, these scientific theories, which were very widespread in the 19th and early 20th century, Europeans had the right and even the duty to conquer and rule the world. The historians and biologists tended to give their support to the empires, first of all because the empires financed them, this is easy, but also because the scientists really saw the empires as engines of progress, as working for the betterment of humankind. The scientists really believed that the European empires were bringing the light of reason, and science and progress to the dark regions of the world, like Africa or India. The empires, this is what they claimed, the empires bring new medicine, they bring new transportation networks like the railroad, they bring new ideas, they bring education, they bring science to the primitive people in Africa and India and Australia. This is why the empires are good and they should be supported. Now, of course, the reality was very often very far away from these fantasies. On many occasions, what the European empires brought was war and famine and exploitation and racism, much more than medicines or roads or schools. For instance, in India, in 1764, the British conquered Bengal, the richest province of India the new British rulers were interested in little except in making themselves rich. So they adopted a disastrous economic policy that within a very few years led to the outbreak of the Great Bengal Famine. The Great Bengal Famine began in 1769, five years after the British took control. It reached catastrophic proportions in 1770 and lasted until 1773. About 10 million Bengalis, that's a third of the province's population back then, died within four years from this calamity. Yet this did not prevent the British and the British scientists from going around saying that they were bringing progress to Bengal and to India. On the other hand, we shouldn't jump to the opposite extreme and conclude that all this talk about progress was just nonsense and that the European empires did nothing of value. In many places, the European empires did provide uh, better health and uh, did provide better economic conditions and greater security from violence to their subjects. The truth is that the issue of the European imperialism is very complicated. The European empires, they were so powerful and they controlled such huge territories and they did so many different things that they provide plenty of evidence for anything you want to say about them. If you want to argue that the European empires brought death and injustice, you can very easily find any number of examples to support this view. If, on the other hand, you want to argue that actually the European empires really improved the conditions of the subject populations by bringing new medicines and technology and so forth, you can find plenty of examples to support this view as well. Due to their alliance with science, the European empires wielded so much power and uh, led to so many changes that perhaps they simply cannot be labeled 
as either good or evil. The European empires, in alliance with science, created the world as we know it today, including the ideologies which we use in order to judge them. So it's very, very difficult to reach a clear uh, decision about whether they are good or bad. This then is how science and empires helped each other. Without the contribution of scientific methods and knowledge, it is hard to believe that Europeans could have conquered the world. But the conquerors returned the favor by providing scientists with information and protection, by supporting all kinds of strange and fascinating projects, and by spreading the scientific way of thinking all over the world. Without imperial support, it is very doubtful whether modern science could have progressed very far. There are very few scientific disciplines that did not begin, begin their lives as servants to imperial projects and that do not owe, even to this day, many of their discoveries and collections and buildings and scholarships to the generous help of army officers and navy captains and imperial governor, governors. Now this is obviously not the whole story. Science was supported by other institutions in addition to the empires. And the European empires, for their part, they rose and flourished thanks to factors other than just science. As we already noted several times, behind the meteoric rise of both modern science and the European empires, there is one particular force which we need to take into account, and this is capitalism, the capitalist economy. Capitalism was what provided the financial means that were vital both for doing science and for building empires. Without the finan this financial support, Columbus could never have reached America, James Cook could never have reached Australia, and Neil Armstrong could never have reached the moon. The next lesson, therefore, will be devoted to examining in detail the rise of the capitalist system and the connections between the capitalist system, modern science, and the European empires.